and good evening, everybody. Welcome back for another edition of Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan. And back in the saddle, Jose Julio Vela is my co-host. As Steven Tyler says, back in the saddle again. That's right. That's right. I'm back. I like, I like your musical again. history knowledge here. Oh. You've never, he, you've never shown that he, on the show before. Stop listening to music in the 90s. So, I'm, so that's where your musical history that's ends. That's where it ends. The you history know. of rock and roll for <laughs> oh, JV ends yes. about 1995. 95. 96, maybe. Brown there. <laughs> yeah. You, you really missed some stuff in the late 90s that was actually pretty decent. Though. Was it? Yeah, was you need it? to expand your catalog. Uh, well, I'm kind of stuck. There's some there's some late 90s kinda stuff that's stuck. decent. You get beyond that and it gets a little... Uh, along with my hair, it's just been the same. There you go. we got a great show for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We have the last of our candidate series. Uh, of course, next week is Election Day, November 6th, Tuesday. So there's already been a record number of voting going on here in Harris County. Early turnout has been huge every day. And tonight we have, we feature the race for the 232nd District Court. Now, personally, once again, this is another race that uh, I selfishly would like to see the candidates on other benches because <laughs> I want them both on the bench. Uh, so this might be the friendliest debate of all that we've ever had on this show. So let's bring in the candidates. First, we'll introduce the incumbent, Judge Kristen Guinea, currently sitting on the 232nd. This is your first time on the show. It is. Thank you for having me. I'm not going to sing. Your husband has been here before. He has. And uh, he did not sing. And, no, he did not. <laughs> and, and he got ridiculed by uh, some of his office, then office mates at the time. Deservedly uh, so, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, he did. But that's okay. You know? It, it is what it is. I, I, is he going to call in and ridicule you, or no. what is he going to do? He's just going to stay silent. He likes being married. He knows better. <laughs> <laughs> Put him on shock. Yeah. He's going to get on shock. He will be on paper if he, if he calls in. <laughs> and in the other corner, the challenger, who has been on this show before. Yep. This time you're actually wearing a suit. Yeah, you know. Josh Hill. Dressed like a person this time. You are? Yeah. <laughs> Not going to show us any... Uh, personal combat moves uh, self-defense depends on what you do that's oh. true I'm gonna put it on him. hey 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 uh, look i yeah. will i will go after you bro <laughs> oh, no have you seen this guy boxing also yeah oh boy he did might, you see that he might fight you over musical select the dude no. will destroy Jimmy, i think you me. may have been there for that fight that was fight night uh my freshman year at, at UT? Texas. yeah i'm sh probably was yeah that was 99 <laughs> oh i was there then uh -huh. yeah yeah i was definitely there yep um i could not tell you the lineup card no, I really I was, couldn't I was tell the you. first fight, and uh, what's his name was was singing uh, Digital Underground was oh, performing. Oh, wow. Yes, I remember that one. Mm -hmm. That's that's about all I remember from Fight Night was Digital Underground. Uh, oh. To be <laughs> from that year. <laughs> to after be after that fight, I literally after my fight, um, I got the video of it. You see me like walking by. My mom pulls me. I give her a hug. She's freaking out. She went to watch. Go into the back. Get my gloves taken off. Wraps taken off. Got in a car, drove to Dallas to fight in a tournament the next day. Jeez, jeez. You know, we were we were actually I forget who I was talking to this past week. We were talking about uh, the ninety nine our, our ninety nine year uh, when you know Major Applewhite and mm -hmm. everybody went up and beat Nebraska that year. It was a good year. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. It was a good year in college. Who was the QB in Nebraska? Was that Frazier at the time? Uh, no. No, I don't remember. It's not important. It might have been Eric Crouch early on. It's all water under the bridge. They lost. They're no longer in the car. I know. I know. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to be here for the next hour or so talking with Josh and Judge Guinea. Uh, if you want to call in, 713-807-1794 is the number. We also, we also have Twitter up, at HCC underscore TV, so you can get your questions and comments in for both of them. Um, why don't we start with you and just give us a brief introduction. Let the voters know who you are. All right. Right here. So my name is Kristen Guinea. I am your presiding judge with the 232nd District Court. I have been there since September of 2017 after being appointed by Governor Abbott. Prior to that, I was on the 179th Criminal District Court for four years. Um, I was a prosecutor for about 10 years, been a defense attorney in total for three or four years. I'm board certified in criminal law. I am one of our four star court presiding judges, so I head up the star or success through addiction recovery court. Um, I'm married to a criminal defense attorney, and we have two children. There you go. Josh. Awesome. Uh, Josh Hill. I uh, was with the Harris County DA's office as an intern and as a prosecutor for just shy of nine years. Uh, been doing criminal defense work since October, September, October 2011. Uh, also board certified in criminal law. Um, Trying to think of what else. Uh, 
got a wife and two beautiful kids, and that's about it in yeah. a nutshell. Is it? I hear you're a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Second degree black belt under Hillian Gracie. Second degree. How many degrees are there? Uh, there are nine, but degrees have nothing to do with ability. It's how much time you've put in. So it's three years, three years, three years, five years, five years, seven, seven, ten, something like that. So how many years have you been putting in? <sighs> About 23 years, Jeez. roughly. How do you like 28? <laughs> I, uh, I joke. I this kid. many? I uh, kid, I kid, I kid. I I'll kid. be 39 in a month. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So most of the people, as I as I said before, this is probably going to be the friendliest debate uh, we've we've ever had on this show. What areas do you guys disagree on, if any? Uh, I'm not sure that there are very many. Uh, I think that we, in terms of the law, I, I think whichever one of us takes this election on Tuesday. Uh, in terms of how the law is applied, in terms of how people are treated with respect, I think you're going to see a lot of the same. I think the only differences might be administrative. Um, that's really about it. I would agree with that. When we interviewed uh, together for The Chronicle, we had an extraordinarily congenial mm -hmm. um, time in the interview, and I think that was reflected in the high scores that we both got. I think that the Chronicle Endorsement Board enjoyed seeing candidates who could come together and talk about different ideas and different policies and be respectful of each other. Um, ours is one of the races, as you've mentioned, where we're both extremely qualified mm -hmm. for the position. We both bring uh, prosecutorial and defense experience. We're both board certified. We both do appellate work. Mm -hmm. um, we both have a very even keel temperament, except yeah. for you know, Josh hurts people in the ring. <laughs> That's, what gives me my, that. That's what gives me my even kill in the courtroom. I get it out of my system. I, uh, I need to bring it to work. <laughs> Tends to be a little bit more yeah. passive aggressive, but um, <laughs> but no, I, I have an, an, an immense amount of respect for, for Josh. Um, and I think that he uh, has, has always been very respectful to me. So Absolutely. You mentioned the Star Court. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about the Star Court. Who are the other judges involved and how did you get involved with it? Yeah, so Star Court has four judges. We just celebrated our 15th year anniversary. Right now, the presiding judges are me, Judge Bradley, who of course is not running, yep. um, Judge Velasquez, and Judge Kapnis. And then under a different umbrella, but a treatment court nonetheless, is uh, Mark Carter, and he does one of the veterans courts. So Star Court um, is a really tailored program for anybody suffering with addiction issues who's been through the system before, has a documented addiction history. They're, they're non-violent offenders. And so under that spectrum, we have people that go to inpatient treatment. We have people that do outpatient treatment, but they all have a very rigorous probation program that tends to be more rigorous, but it also has more services than I can offer in my regular court for people who need a little bit more supervision and a little bit more help staying sober. How does one enter into the Stark Courts? Uh, there are, I know in my court, as in other courts that I've been in as a defense attorney, the coordinators all have forms. So you fill out the form. If you meet the grant criteria for admission into Star Court, and you, it's not a negotiating court. So when you go to Star Court as a client, you say, I want help. And they say, well, this is our treatment plan for you. If the client wants it, then they're part of Star Court. And if they don't, then they'll go back to the home court where their case originated. Josh, I, I know you've been on the defense side for, for a while now. Uh, you probably, like all of us, have had clients that have gone through the Star Court. Is there anything that you see that you would change about the Star Court or things that you would like to see implemented should you win the election? You know, as odd as it is, most of my clients in the felony courts have been violent offenders um, and drug dealers that have not qualified for Star Court. So I haven't had much of an opportunity to see it firsthand or through my clients. Uh, what I've heard, it's a phenomenal program, and I've heard that they, they actually do a lot of great work to help people with recovery uh, through addiction, but um, haven't had much personal experience with it myself. Do you guys, uh, and, and I want to ask this question early on because <clears throat> I asked it kind of a little late in the program last week, but uh, you both are, you're a white female, you're a white male, okay? Mm -hmm. I want to know from each of y'all, the majority of the people that we see coming through the criminal justice system are poor minorities. And they're going to look at this, and they're still voters. And, I mean, their families are still voters. They're going to want to look at this, and they want to know, how am I, how can I be sure that the candidates that are on the ticket that I'm voting for that don't look like me, how can they, we be sure that this candidate is going to give us a fair, you know, due process procedure in the courtroom? Absolutely. Um, I'll take that. Uh, why not? 
for me, a lot of it is not experiencing what they experience firsthand. I will never know what it's like to be in their shoes. The best I can do is get secondhand knowledge, speaking with my clients, asking them what their concerns are, because I'm, I'm actively representing them as they go through it. I'm talking to them, I'm hearing what their concerns are, whether it's in the courtroom or out of the courtroom. There's an impact to being a part of the criminal justice system that reaches into their family life, into their ability to get employment, into their ability to get housing and other things. So I talk to them about it. I wanna know what the problems are. Uh, on top of that, since deciding to run for judge, I wanted to make sure I had a better grasp on certain issues. So I've, I've tried to read a number of books that kind of help me more thoroughly understand things from a conceptual level um, to make sure that I, I, I have a better grasp of, of what people are going through. And for me, I think the actions speak louder than words. I can't change what I look like or mm -hmm. the background um, that I bring to the bench, but what anybody who's been in my court, when I put somebody on probation for an aggravated robbery, for instance, or a serious felony, here's my speech. And it is, I have skin in the game with you. I want you to succeed. I go out I try to go out to our residential treatment programs every six months so that I lay hands and I can touch somebody. They can lay eyes on me while they're undergoing treatment. Um, I want them to know, and I give them the speech, they've all heard it, sort of like Judge Stanley's speech for misdemeanor. Um, they live in my community. We shop at the same grocery stores. My children may go to school with their children. And it does not behoove me to punish them if I can help them turn the corner, make better decisions, give them the resources that they need to overcome addiction or uh, address mental health concerns. And so those things I hope can give somebody who may not look like me security that I do have um, an understanding that we all should be treated with respect. And to the extent that I can help somebody, I'm gonna do it. What are some of the resources that Star Courts provides? You've mentioned that a couple of times. Well, so Star Court has its own resources, and then generally um, I have a file folder of resources that I give out um, to anybody who wants them. Um, housing resources uh, for both men, women, and families. Addiction resources within our community, both inpatient and outpatient. We also have, through our community supervision department, the uh, Women Helping Ourselves program, the Young Men About Change, Safe P through TDC and SATF Peden through TDC. Those are our in custody programs. Uh, um, interme inter intermediate sanction facility also through TDC. Um, but what I find more than anything is that our community based resource providers are better equipped to deal with people going through mental health crises or um, veterans issues with P PTSD. Camp Hope is a wonderful resource for veterans. Um, we've got a bunch of groups that do addiction recovery work. And so Many of those, if they're not free, have sliding scales. And so I just try to find the best fit. We've got a lot of resources. The Beacon Downtown does license reinstatement work. If, um, we've all seen it. Somebody coming through our criminal justice system um, tries to stay on the, the straight and narrow, and they consistently get pulled over for not having um, a, a valid driver's license, and mm -hmm. that just starts the whole process over again. Once you fall into the DPS hole, it is hard to get out. And so the Beacon offers pro bono legal services to help people get their license back in order. I think that's really important, and a lot of people don't know about that. And so when I have somebody before me either getting a probation or maybe taking a time served or whatever the issue is, if I can help them make the better choices the next steps, I'm absolutely gonna do that. You know, uh, when we were all growing up as kids and probably even early on in our, as we all, the three of us, because you're, you're a few years behind us, but even even when we started practicing law, the, the, the sentiment was, whether it was Republican or Democrat running, tough on crime. Um, and that phrase, you don't see that anymore. Uh, and the phrase is criminal justice reform. That, that's the buzz phrase now that everybody seems to be running on, right? It's, it's how do we reform our criminal justice system? So what I wanna know from both of y'all, you, Josh, being the outsider, what are the ideas of criminal justice reform that you wanna to bring to the bench? And you, having been on the bench, what, what are you hoping to either continue or bring changes should you get elected again? So whoever wants to start off on that, sure. go ahead. I guess I'll go, why not? <laughs> um, <clears throat> for me, I think people are starting to finally realize that being tough on crime and locking somebody up doesn't really help anything other than to teach somebody how to survive in prison. When you learn how to survive in prison, you take those skills back to the streets where you end up back in prison. 
and that doesn't help anybody, doesn't make the community safer. It, it does for that one individual while they're locked up, but there are other people to fill that space. And then when they get back out of prison, they're more dangerous. It, it doesn't help anybody. Um, I'd like to see, and I think it's the direction the system is trying to go, and I think it's the direction the system will go if judges don't get in the way, is for more of a get to the root of the problem. What What's causing the problem? If it's drugs, is it truly an addiction, or is it an addiction to cover up a mental health issue? Is it um, socioeconomic? Is it based on where you came from, what you know? Can we give you tools that can help you succeed and pull you out of this system so, so you can be successful? So I, I would like to see a more rehabilitative look at the criminal justice system. I, I think Everybody you look at, and I think as defense attorneys, prosecutors, judges, all kind of have the same feeling of, is this somebody who did something wrong, or is this something that, somebody that terrifies us? You said, right? you said that judges don't get in the way. What do you mean by that? Um, some judges, and I, I wouldn't include Kristen in this, uh, some judges... I wondered the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some judges will look at the defendants in their court, and they try to... Uh, I guess, judge them or uh, they, they look at them as if, well, you should be more like me, right? Um, people that have probationers in their court and they say, well, I could do it, why can't you? Well, I, as the judge, whoever that may be, maybe had certain privileges growing up. Maybe they had family money. Maybe they had the ability to get the education they want. Maybe they've never had an addiction issue or maybe they don't have certain family issues that cause them to go down these paths. So they can't connect, they don't understand whatsoever. So when they see somebody who's completely different from them with a different background or mental health problems that they just don't understand, they're saying, well, why didn't you make it to your probation meeting? Or you're on a probation for drugs. Why did you hit the pipe again? I don't get it because you should be like me. I think that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, if a judge doesn't understand or doesn't try to understand what these people are going through, they don't understand the recovery process. Maybe you can send some light into it because I'd imagine that a, as a judge, you have to deal with a number of things and si situations that uh, you, you did not deal with um, as a prosecutor or a defense attorney because you're a judge now. Uh, you might have had some issues with it, but when you are sentencing somebody or putting or providing conditions on somebody or putting somebody on probation, what tools and resources are available to you as a judge and how do you use them? So to answer your question right. first, Jimmy, and then because it kind of loops in, um, I think it's important for people to understand whether they're judges or just another part of the system that with a, w the vast majority of people that we send to prison are coming out, right? right. And our prisons aren't equipped to rehabilitate people. Some people need to go to prison. The nature of the crime, their criminal history, whatever. There are a ton of factors. Yep. And But prisons are just sort of holding cells. There are a couple of programs in prison now, one of which I work with, Prison Entrepreneurship. I right. know that you know mm -hmm. it, JV. It's a, it's a program near and dear to my heart because it truly transforms lives. Um, I would like to see, in terms of reformation of the system, um, state jail do job training, do addiction recovery. All of these add-on programs have been chipped away um, budgetarily in the legislature, and if right. they could be replaced, Starcourt is a perfect example. We save money. Ultimately, over the course of decades of decades of, of somebody's involvement in the criminal justice system, if we can get them into Starcourt, get them sober, get them jobs, and get them on their feet, they're not coming back. And so I think what the system in whole needs to be more cognizant of is that the majority of the people that we serve in criminal justice are on the margins already. Best case scenario, many of them made a bad decision. Um, but if we're willing to give them a second chance, it has to be a true second chance. It can't be a, I'm going to put you here and wait for you to mess up and then send you to prison. If I put somebody on probation, especially over the objection of the state, I have to put skin in the game and I have to give them every opportunity and resource to succeed. So part of how I do that, we've got, of course, the um, Texas Risk Assessment Screening Evaluation that sort of gives the judges an idea of risk assessment and programs that they may need in order to succeed. But a lot of it really just is my 18 years in criminal justice, right? 10 years as a prosecutor, four years as a defense attorney. I've stood in both sides. I know the issues when the lawyers are frustrated either with the other lawyer or their clients. What, I, I've been in those shoes. I've had those frustrations. Yeah. And so um, in assessing punishment, 
especially for probations, I try to use all of those tools and all of those experiences to, to guide me. You know, there's, a, there's been a clamoring amongst some that, you know, we need more police on the street, we need more law enforcement, we need to get tough on violent crime. Um, it, the, the DA's office itself has kind of, under, under Kimog, has kind of shifted its focus from drug cases uh, to really, you know, it, it seems anyway, going after violent crime, aggravated robberies, that sort of stuff, and focusing, the, trying to focus the resources on those cases. Um, but my question to both of y'all is, you know, so a lot of those cases, particularly the aggravated robberies, and some of them, look, they're, they're horrendous cases. I mean, people, mm -hmm. people get beat, they get pistol whipped, they get, some get shot, um, you know, some of the victims in the, in, during the robbery and everything, but some of the perpetrators are very, very young too. Um, I mean, I've, I've represented some who got snatched out of the state system and put into the federal system who ended up getting highly punitive sentences. But some of them do remain in the state system. And I look at it and I, I, I look at these kids, you know, kind of what you were alluding to, Josh, earlier about background and where they come from and maybe not having certain opportunities in life. And you have 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids, maybe even a little older, that are, are just in a, a terrible circumstance. And here they get brought into this robbery crew. Uh -huh. um, I bet everybody here would agree with me and everybody's probably shared the same experience. I've met with clients and, and had an opportunity to get to know them. Yeah. And after you get to know them, you sit there thinking, this person is smarter than, has a higher IQ or higher intelligence than I do, than the prosecutor does, than the judge does, than everybody in this courtroom. But they didn't have the opportunities I had. I'm right. fortunate to be where I am today. This person didn't have those opportunities. Now, are they so far lost that we can't drag them back in? Um, or, or what do we need to do to get them back to where they can utilize that. And, yeah, and that's, and that's why I wonder from both of you, I mean, what are some of the factors in assessing punishment on a case like that that need to be considered? Um, and I'm not asking like how you would rule on a case like that, obviously, but just, just the things that need to be taken in consideration as a judge, because, you know, you look at some of those, those cases and sometimes it seems like, you know, some of these people have been really over punished by the system. And like you were saying, they go to prison for a decade or more in mm -hmm. some cases, and they're gonna come out. I mean, they're 21 years old. Right. I mean, what, what can we do to, besides what you were talking about earlier, but in those, in those violent cases, to, to really help those people? So you started with the idea that there's, there's been a conversation about whether or not we need to increase law enforcement. Yeah. And I think that that is part of the solution, right? So law enforcement, we've moved away from what is termed cr community community law enforcement, mm -hmm. right? Where cops work the same beats, they know the people. And I think in depressed communities, economically depressed communities, when you have a police officer that your community trusts, that is a leadership figure, that that makes an enormous difference in how people respect or think of law enforcement, how they think of right and wrong. Um, I've talked to, and I know that you all had, had this conversation with young offenders when I was doing criminal defense work, but I didn't hurt anybody. And I would say, but you put a gun in someone's face and, and yeah. that's a serious crime. Right. And it carries a, a, a lengthy prison sentence or at least the possibility of a lengthy prison sentence. So there's a disconnect about mm -hmm. expectations. I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't even get any money. I shouldn't have to go to prison. Um, and I think if we started at the community level before we get into the criminal justice system, it would have a huge impact, right? Education, community services, mental health services, addiction services, those things, it's great when they start in the criminal justice system or it's great when they're provided in the criminal justice system. But if they started before, I think you'd see a dramatic decrease in the people coming through our courts. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I think that the notion of what everybody wants to see in terms of increased law enforcement, the, the notion of it seems to be we want it to get violent criminals off the street rather than to really, like you say, get to know the community, to be able to... They can be one and the same, even if yeah, the expectation sure. at the beginning isn't the same. Right, because, mm -hmm. I, because I think there's a, there, there used to be some element that law enforcement could act as an educational tool within the community. And I, I don't see that function anymore, yeah. frankly. And frankly, I'd say while the, all the police agencies are incredibly understaffed and undertrained currently, and they're overwhelmed with the workload they have, 
I think the criminal justice system currently is equipped to be a band-aid after things have already gone horribly wrong. All that money that we could put into more police on the streets could be fun put towards education or community programs to try and divert people away from even going down that pathway in the first place. Uh, the problem is trying to sell that to somebody as opposed to, yeah, but there's violent crime right now and we need to fix it right now, rather than, well, if we can stop it at the source, there would be a lot less violent crime next year, the year after, and the year after. That's, that's kind of one of the hard things to deal with. Where um, does funding come from? Start courts, specialty courts, programs, where does it come from? The specialty courts are funded at least in part and that's above my pay grade. I just sit on the bench. Uh, but they are funded in part by grants, both federal and state grants. And are you, are, are you having to report to a board or is it, are you reporting to county commissioners and regarding your statistics? Because I know, like for example, um, we hear occasionally on the headlines, for example, I think it was the, the, the court for trafficked women that Derbysh, Judge Derbyshire heads was getting yanked on its funding a year or two ago. And there was some issue with that. And um, are you all reporting to an agency or? We do. We have both private agencies that, that sort of oversee, not that we report to in terms of, I need you to approve sure. our work, but they come in, they, um, they, they judge our statistics, they judge our programs and, and make helpful suggestions. We just had one of those reviews about three months ago. Um, we also, I know, report to the state. I don't know who in the state agency we report to because I'm not doing the reporting. But there are measures by which we can say we need to do better with this. We just had, in fact, yesterday, our 70th drug-free baby in Star Court. She was out of my docket on Wednesday. Um, and it, I think for her, will help her stay. I'm hopeful that it helps her. That gives her an incentive to embrace all the tools and the resources we've given her in Star Court and stay sober for that new baby. Was StarCourt something that you just kind of inherited, or is that something that you were drawn to and applied for? Or? When I sat on the 179th, I often would fill in for judges when they couldn't make their StarCourt. Maybe they were in trial or out of town. I sat for Judge Carter uh, several times. And because it is a non-adversarial court, it is a therapeutic court, it's entirely different than how I get to interact with the probationers out of my own court. I enjoyed it so much that uh, when Judge Jackson stepped down, I guess in January, I volunteered. Um, it, what, what draw, what, why, what, what's this inspiration behind it? I mean, what, what drew you to that? I, I think really getting an opportunity to see from start to finish somebody succeed. Um, the pride in their eyes when they can report that they've been sober, some of them for two weeks, some of them for two years. Um, but that's a struggle for somebody. And one of my favorite questions is, when was the last time that you were sober for seven months? And it's usually for people when they were 15, 16, 18 years old. So wow. it, mm -hmm. it is a, um, a feel good moment and we don't get a whole lot of those down in our courthouse to, so to see lives change, to see families be able to reconnect, to see people get long term stable employment, not just a job that's gonna pay paycheck to paycheck, but something that then turns into a career that they can do and earn retirement and get insurance is huge. I want to remind everybody, we uh, take your phone call, 713-807-1794, if you want to call in, if you've got a legitimate question, or if you want to harass. <laughs> we're, okay with, we're okay with that, too. Um, Is but no. not allowed to ask me a question? No, <laughs> yeah. not allowed to call in. <laughs> not calling in. Girls go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We also, Father's not allowed to call in. Uh, also, send us your questions and comments on Twitter, at HCCLA underscore TV. Um, I was, I was speaking of Twitter. I was watching a debate today. Uh, I didn't get involved in it because I didn't want to uh, get involved in the time suck that it probably would create in my life for today. But as I was slipping through, uh, it was a debate about you know collateral consequences on, on people and whether or not deferred adjudication was really giving somebody a second chance. Um, and the debate on one hand was uh, was a prosecutor and a defense attorney, and they were. Uh, debating the merits of this, and it talked about expunctions and and non-disclosures and and the viability of, of those things, um, and you know at the at the end of it, uh, it was where you know the feeling was deferred adjudication really wasn't all that great of a deal um, at the end of the day because. Um, you had you still had a lot of collateral consequences from deferred. Um, you had the long waiting period even after the case got dismissed uh, before the case is even sealed. So you know if it's a felony deferred and you you know you get two or three years on a felony deferred, then you have a five year waiting period on top of that. Well, you're 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 sitting here almost a decade out 
of that case hanging out there and being a collateral consequence on you from getting an apartment, um, you know, possibly getting a job, doing, doing lots of things. In terms of your role on the bench or if you got the bench, is there something that you would maybe advocate for to the legislature in, in changing and, and maybe hoping to facilitate um, a change in the potential collateral consequences that come with a deferred adjudication? Because frankly, <clears throat> if, if you're the last stop as the judge, that's all you can do the, in, in a lot of cases. That's the best that you can do. If the state isn't willing to give a pretrial diversion, but they're willing to waive their jury trial, the, the last stop is the judge gives deferred, but that's all you can, your, your, your hands are tied. That's the best you can do in most situations. So can you guys advocate to the legislature in a judiciary uh, capacity to make, to at least ease some of those collateral consequences? Well, yes. And I think that if you look back, I mean, even in just the last 10 years, the, the strides we've made in making non-disclosure better I think every legislative session in the last eight years, it's gotten better. Right. And so I th change is hard yeah. unless it's an election. And then apparently they're not so hard sometimes. But <laughs> 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 um, so I think that as we've moved forward um, and, and as we continue to move forward, you'll see that. I think that's a really legitimate gripe that it's not quite the gold star that we proclaim it to be, but in the end, and just being very pragmatic, it still is better than going to prison. No, absolutely. And so um, there have to be consequences for actions. I think that the legislature is beginning to recognize that we can't make those lifetime obligations and that there really are very significant collateral consequences to being undeferred. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. A little push is never a bad thing. And, and you know, I mean, I, there are some clients that you just see they're probably not going to make the deferred. And, you know, and I wonder if there's just too quick of a hook sometimes. Um, you know, you know, where, where does the real second chance come in? Is the second chance giving them deferred or is the second chance, hey, we need to guide them through this deferred and, you know, make sure that they get through it successfully, giving them every opportunity to get through it and not be able to have such a quick hook. Yeah, I, th I think deferreds need to be finely tailored to every single individual because everybody's different. If mm -hmm. you are struggling, we'll, we'll use addiction because that seems to be the most common theme. If you're struggling with addiction and you are stressed out because you have to have full-time employment, you have to be doing community service work, you have to do your, your recovery work, you have to be in, in your, your therapy sessions, you have to be um, doing everything to maintain your sobriety, uh, all while paying exorbitant fees, maybe monitoring and other things, that's setting you up for failure. You need to be focused on on the main problem that got you into the criminal justice system. And in that, that case, it would be your sobriety. So if the deferred is fine-tuned enough where you're really focusing on just staying sober first, once you're stable and obviously having a full-time job is a part of stability. Having an education or being a full-time student is part of that. But first, you have to be sober. Once you're sober, adding those other things in to, to create a structure where you can succeed, I think is more important uh, than some judges, judge getting not included, uh, some judges who will do everything they can to yank somebody right off of probation. Um, oh, you're late on your fees, we need to have a talk, or test a positive for marijuana one time, I don't think I wanna work with you anymore. That's, that's silly, that doesn't help anybody. Yeah, I mean, I think the hardest part is you know, you have some judges on one hand who, and, and look, it's, it, it goes back to my, my question about, you know, those from, from poor minority families, how, how do they ensure they're getting a fair uh, shake in the system? Because there are some judges who, you know, they will look at it and they'll say, okay, well, you can get deferred, but the first chance you mess up, I'm, I'm, I'm yanking it. And, and usually it's the poor minority defendants. Yep. Whereas on the other hand, if it's, if it's a kid, you know, from Tanglewood or something like that, who's got an addiction problem, but their kid, their parents are, have the money to put them in the best rehab and they can afford it. Well, we're going to give them every opportunity because, you know, they can afford to do private rehab. On the flip side, there's some judges who say, well, I'm not going to give that kid in Tanglewood deferred because he's just getting it because his parents have money. Yep. Um, and, and, and I mean, I, I feel like we have to strike a balance. You can't, you can't go and, and punish one because they don't have money or another court punish someone because they do have money. I mean, the root of the problem is to make a better person regardless of what background they come from, right? It is. Yeah, I think you gotta ask yourself, 
can this person be guided in a way that they can improve, even slow incremental improvements? If they can still improve, let's try and work with them to improve. If they're blowing this off and they don't care and they don't want to be helped and you're never going to get through to them, well, you have to treat it differently, obviously. But if there's still some room for improvement, some way where maybe we could steer them a little farther and, and inch them along till they get to the point where they could be successful, never come back to the system, that's awesome. That would be great. But I'm sure you've seen a number of times, we've all seen it. There's some people that just don't care. Hey, I took the deferred to get out of jail today. Isn't that um, what the tools are for? The, yeah. to, to equalize things? To, yes. And um, what are some of those things that the tool looks for and it, it takes into account? Depends on who's interviewing them. Well, <laughs> and, how, and how are you going to fix and that? I think, I think Josh is exactly right. I know that many of the judges, myself included, have had issues with the community supervision department because we're not given the raw data on the uh, risk assessment score. Um, so as we all know, an evaluation is only as good as the collector and the data that's being collected. And so that's why it is a tool. It is not, for me, the end-all, be-all. It can. In fact, I just did it today on a client uh, who was asking for deferred, and the, the risk assessment indicated that they had a need for uh, inpatient residential treatment. This young man was the sole provider for his two elderly parents uh, who were on SSI disability and would have been in a significant bind. He also had period of sobriety in his life, so I knew that he could do it. So we had a conversation about, I will let you start an intensive outpatient treatment, and if that's not enough for you, we'll move to residential. But, I mean, that's where you've got to have people, regardless of party, who know what they're doing, who have been in the trenches, who have seen the clients that we see every day. And when you have that experience, I have for years said a, a good judge is two things. It's one, somebody who's experienced, and somebody who has the courage to make difficult decisions. Because at the end of the day, I make... I have made bad decisions. I, I hope um, that I make bad decisions erring on the side of the defendant in, in giving somebody a second chance that they didn't really respond to. Um, but it is a weighty decision, and it's one that I take seriously. I know Josh would take seriously if he were on the 232nd. Um, I, I don't think that, so, that, I think sometimes the, the gravity of what the judges are asked to do daily is overlooked by folks who come through our courthouse. Sure, absolutely. What is the, as a judge, what is what are some of the the most difficult situations or decisions or um, things that you've been confronted with uh, that you've had to make? And I'll also ask you, Josh, what are some of the biggest uh, things that sh that concern you about being a judge? Because you're gonna have to make some real serious decisions. Absolutely. Not that you don't do those things either way, but uh, is there an experience that you can share or, or some of the things that challenge you every day as being a judge, Judge Guinea, and then. I'll toss it to you, Josh, as to some of the things that you are either concerned or um, not fear, but things that like, hey, this is coming your way and, uh, sure. and that you haven't been confronted yet with. I think for me, I know my very first month on the bench when I was in the 179th, I had a PSI that had been set long before I took the bench. And I remember hearing it. It was a, a case. I don't recall the specifics, but it was prison was appropriate. So it was just a decision about how much prison. And I remember thinking, what an odd thing, because I'm going to say a number, and that's going to be the answer, right. right? I had been a prosecutor. I made what I felt were fair recommendations. I had been a defense attorney asking for different recommendations or accepting recommendations on behalf of my clients. But here I was saying, and this is the sentence, and that was heavy. Where do you, where do, where do you draw your strength from to, to be able to, to deal with that every single day? What are some of your inspirations? Um, I'm, I, I make no bones about it. I pray. Um, I try to take every case individually and earnestly listen to the aggravating circumstances and the mitigating circumstances because each case has its own separate set of those issues. Um, and I really just trust that I was put there because, you know, I, Josh and I have had this conversation before. Nobody's turning out except my own mother. Uh, to vote for Kristen Guinea, same for Josh. Um, so as much as I would like to say that the voters put me Wait, in a mom, place, your mom's not coming to vote for me. No, no <laughs> she's coming to vote for me. Your mother's going to vote for you. <laughs> um, as much as I would like to think that there was the judges, the judges were placed on the benches by educated voters making informed decisions. I don't know that that's necessarily the case across the board, um, but I do. For me, and there are certainly great judges who've only been prosecutors or only defense attorneys, but for me, I am more comfortable in my judge skin, having been on both sides of the of the bench. Sure. What about you, Josh? 
I would say what she described at the beginning of her answer is what I fear, and I think fear is an appropriate word for it, is the gravity of you know you're going to have to lock somebody up and what's the magic number and how do you come to that number. And I'd imagine as a judge, you have to rely a lot on both lawyers to, to feed you information. You can only gather so much on your own from the bench, so you rely on both sides to feed it to you and you're hoping you're getting the full picture. You hope you understand all of it before you before you pronounce a sentence and that's that's something that'll be incredibly heavy and what are some of your inspirations where, where, where are you going to draw on this strength because the the burden that is placed upon a judge in a district court is something that's phenomenal that i don't think unless you're down there every day and see it and uh, or been a part of it um one can truly comprehend and sure. so where where and you have to be very strong because the people, the community, the defense bar, the prosecutor, the state of Texas, and the voters uh, put uh, that responsibility and that you accept. And so you can't buckle. Nope. And so where, where, where do you find your inspiration to deal with those kind of things? So what are they? A number of places, actually. So first of all, when it comes to the career, when it comes to when I was a prosecutor as a defense attorney now and if I were to win this election, uh, a lot of my decision making comes from remembering uh, victims of cases when I was a prosecutor that would tell me their stories, that I had to be their voice, I had to hear about the pain and the struggles they faced, whether I won the trial, lost the trial, cut a deal, whatever it was, and remembering how they felt about it, what they expressed to me. Some were happy even after an acquittal, some were heartbroken after what I thought was a great deal. Um, I remember uh, Judge Guinea and I tried a case together and I got a letter from the victim. It was an acquittal. And I got a letter from the victim thanking me and, and it was real heartfelt about how she was so happy that I'd stood up for her even when her own family wouldn't. That's a part of it. Uh, when I hear the struggles of my clients and their families and what they go through and the impact that the criminal justice system has on them, that gives me a different perspective. I look to my own family and think what would happen if they were the victims of a crime or if they were stuck in this system what would i want to have happen and you put that together and that is a whole lot of information it's it's a lot of stress kind of tangled together and as odd as it sounds uh, my whole life since i was four or five started doing combat sports whether it was karate taekwondo wrestling in high school and college jiu-jitsu mixed martial arts whatever always learn that whatever type of uncomfortable situation you're in, no matter how bad it seems, no matter how rough it is, and you just want to give up, put in the effort, put in the work, be confident in what you're doing, really try to assess the entire situation, and the correct opportunity should present itself. You're going to mess up sometimes. You're not always going to make the right call. But if you take everything as it comes and you look for it, you, you should be able to find something that's more right than wrong. You think you got the skin to be a judge? I think so. You know, you, you talked about um, how the voters are going out. It's really not about you individually or the candidates. I mean, there's, there's so much bigger things driving this. For both of you, all, I mean, I think it's generally accepted amongst those of us at the courthouse who are down there every day that you both are two of the most qualified people to sit on the bench. Uh, period in the story regardless of what happens in the election but does it does it just kind of frustrate y'all that there's not a better way that the, that, the, that the system can't work that I mean here we are I mean we're, we get to talk to you now and, and people get to know you but I mean and you get out on the campaign trail and you get to know people but I mean is there part of you that's just like man I don't know if all this if I've really if I've done anything to affect my outcome in this, I've put all this work in and, you know, here I am, I'm, 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 I'm talking to these two idiots on, on TV um, and taking up an hour of my time and life when I could be with my kids. And you really don't know what's going to happen. I mean, there's, there's, you're, you're, you're powerless on this stuff. How, how, how do you, how do you deal with that? <laughs> From just from an election standpoint, it's I mean, extraordinarily frustrating to be as type A as I know that Josh and I both are, and recognize that on a very real level, I am not in control of my fate and what my employment situation will be on January first. So I can do the best that I can. I, I, you know, I think, mm -hmm. especially with the end of straight ticket 
voting coming in 2020. It's going to be more incumbent upon all of the candidates, not just to go to our echo chambers and the Republican or the Democrat groups that we know support us, but also to go to civic groups and community outreach groups. I think it's important, especially for the judges, more so for the criminal judges than anybody else, to be accountable for the community and to go out and answer the questions that you've been asking tonight about what I feel about second chances and how can I make people feel more at ease when they're in the system, whether as a victim or as a a defendant. Um, I think those things are important, but at the end of the day, um, I know from personal experience, (laughs) the chips don't always fall where you want them to. You pick yourself up, you dust off, and you move on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... and, And... both to both of y'all. I mean, whoever doesn't get the bench, will y'all run again? Will y'all? Would do, I mean, do y'all want to be on the bench? And and I mean, do you really feel to each of you? I mean, some people they feel a calling to do a certain job, whether it's to be a, a prosecutor, to be a defense lawyer, to be a, a plaintiff's lawyer, to help people get money for their injuries. Some people really want to be a judge. I mean, is that both of y'all that that? Do you think you've found your niche and, and is this something that you really want to pursue regardless of what happens next Tuesday? I'd like to know why also. Um, I don't think that I'll run again. It's hard. I think, Josh, it, the, the time away from my family and the stress that I put on my young children who I, you guys are awesome, but I'm not home with them tonight. Yeah. And that's often the case on the campaign trail. I will say that um, I have a niche in criminal justice. Um, I have found through my opportunities as a judge a bunch of groups that I am extraordinarily proud of the work that I've done with them. I'll do work in the non in the non-governmental sector, doing and advocating for prison reform, criminal justice reform, getting people on the margins off. So I'll still be around, but probably not as a judge or judicial candidate or as a defense attorney. You know, it's hard for me to answer for sure. The The whole reason I'm running <clears throat> was I was sitting around with some prosecutors and defense lawyers at docket call, and we were griping about the current situation of the criminal justice system and how a lot of the judges just are not considerate of, of anybody. I'm not talking about defendants. I'm not talking about witnesses. I'm talking about the lawyers for both sides. When a prosecutor has to show up with 10 aggravated sexual assault and murder cases set every Monday and they're losing their mind trying to get prepared on all of them and in reality they're getting prepared on none um, they're stressed out of their mind the defense attorneys when they're saying look judge I have this very big important thing a family event whatever can we move this trial just a couple of days and the judge is saying no like you got to be respectful of people's time you got to understand that the lawyers the witnesses the victims the defendants were all human Life gets in the way of some of this, and you got to let go of a little bit of control and treat people right. While griping about it, somebody said, well, why don't you just run and do it yourself? I said, okay, fine, I will. <laughs> uh, that's literally how it came to be. At the time, 232nd was a vacant bench because Mary Lou Keel had been elected to a different office. So I put my name in the hat, and unfortunately, a, a <laughs> friend of mine gets appointed a, a month and a half or so later. Um, and running has been eye-opening. It it has let me know that I really do want to help and improve the system by whatever means necessary. As a prosecutor, I could do it for people whose cases were in my hands. As a defense attorney, I could do it one person at a time. As a judge, I think I would have a broader spectrum to work at that. And there are a lot of other avenues to to assist as well. Um, but right now, my focus is on trying to get on a bench to, to try and set an example on how a court can be run um, efficiently and realizing that everybody before you is a human being and, and they have other concerns as well. Um, Let's talk about how to run a court efficient, efficiently. How are you running your court and would you consider it efficient and what things have you done to make it more judicial efficient? So I've never been one of those who lives and dies by the numbers. You know, you, I'm sure that you all have practiced in courts where the daily numbers for all 22 of the district courts are laid out for the prosecutors. Sure. Um, I do think that there is some importance in that. Um, I've always thought you never want to be on the high end or the low end. I think today I, I looked after having not looked for a while and we're right in the middle. I'm comfortable with that. Some cases take longer than they need to, but it's because everybody comes to the courthouse with issues and I can't legislate or I can't deal with all of those uh, maybe as efficiently as I would like to. Um, you know, as you all know, being down there, Harvey has decimated our level of efficiency. We're working back to getting back into the yeah. groove of things and we're in a, a better than we had been placed now, but still lots of work to go. Um, 
I mean, that really is a joint effort. It's the sheriff's department, the clerk's office, the DA's office, the, the judiciary. Um, and everybody's worked really well together, but we still have some tweaks that can be made to make it more efficient. Um, I do one of the docket systems where I have a large docket one day a, a week. Um, my docket day is Thursday. I think that's very helpful for me because when we are in trial, it means that I'm not having to take breaks every hour. We can get more testimony in during a day. Um, it is efficient for the jurors who seem to like it better because the, the cases take shorter time. There are always tweaks. Uh, I think coming in January when the things get a little bit more, um, when the system, the post Harvey system continues to be tweaked and we're allowed to have jury trials more regularly in the CJC, I think that the system as a whole will get more efficient. You know, it's interesting you talked about showing respect for the entire system. I, I will say, I mean, just last year in your court, I mean, I had an issue where I was trying to get a result that the prosecutors in the court couldn't give me. <laughs> and I needed time to be able to get a meeting because I just couldn't get a meeting with the person that I needed to, to meet with. And, uh, you know, I approached you with the, with the issue and you said, don't worry, let's just, you know, take a few weeks. Hopefully you get the meeting. If you don't get the meeting, let's just keep pushing and we'll, you know, we'll come back and you don't have to have your client come back. You just come back and inform me. I mean, it, it's just little things like that. It, when you Absolutely. don't have, you know, when you don't have somebody just trying to beat you over the head and saying, well, if you can't get the meeting, then we're just setting this for trial. It's like, well, wait, wait a that's, second. That's exactly. That only hurts your clients yeah, and it hurts the right. victims. Mm -hmm. Every time a victim has to get a subpoena on a case, yeah. they have to get mentally prepared for it. I know that as a former prosecutor and as a defense attorney. I, that sort of push, in my estimation, and in my court, forgets the aspects of humanity that are too often forgotten in our criminal justice. So if I can be a human and a decent human being for two hours a day during docket, right. it makes everybody's life better, I hope. Yeah, well, it yes, does. It does. It, well, it does. The way I see it is, let the lawyers do their work. Don't get in the middle of their work. If two opposing sides can agree on something, literally, side A is opposed to side B. They have different interests at heart. If they can agree on something like, yeah, it's okay, we can have a little more time on this, why on earth does a judge need to step in the middle of that? Unless you think people are really taking advantage of you, yeah. which is incredibly rare, just let the lawyers do their work. Let them get what they need to get done on both sides, prosecutors and defense. Unless somebody's harping up, unless the defendant is asking for a speedy trial or a prosecutor has a witness issue and is saying, look, they're, they're playing games here, I think just let the lawyers handle their business and and step back. Just be the referee. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, that, that, and that's what makes it, it, that's what makes me frustrated that you know you guys are running against one another uh, <laughs> because we could use more of that in the courthouse, especially today. I Absolutely. mean, there's there's just no reason to be cracking the whip for for what you know. I mean, if we can work this case out and it just takes time, I mean, we're, we're crunching a bunch of people through the system. For an arbitrary metric, yeah. what is your docket number? Right. You know, it, that's not that's cares? not really criminal justice reform. No. Uh, I mean, that's docket reform, but it's not really, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's not meeting any of the goals that we've been sitting here talking about for the last, what, uh, 50 minutes? Um, if you're an outlier on the low end or the incredibly high end, maybe there are questions that need to be asked. Sure. But like, like Judge Guinea said, if you're somewhere in the middle, the docket number shouldn't really be concerning anybody. There's, it's not an indication of justice. It's not an indication of how much work has been done on a case um, or how good the judge is. What made you run as a Democrat? Um, that's, that's what I more identify as, I guess, on the political spectrum. There, there are aspects from the left and right that I agree with on, on both sides. Um, but I, especially in terms of the criminal justice system, I think I'm, I'm more of a liberal, more of a Democrat. What about you as a Republican? I ran as a Republican in 2012 because that's the party that I identify with. Um, I think that it's true that there are planks in each party's platform that don't serve the greater good for the 80% of the people in the middle in Texas or America. But that being said, at the end of the day, I think Josh would agree, I don't think that partisan politics has any place in my job. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I tell jury panels when they come, my job is, you said a referee, I say an umpire, it's to call balls and strikes. Um, I don't have a home team. I don't have a, a, a dog in the hunt. And so if I'm doing my job well, it means, and it is the case, once a case is over, it's gone for me. I don't remember it, I don't recall the details because that's, I'm on to the next case where I don't have a dog in the hunt and it's just calling balls and strikes because that's what my job is. 
how I feel about particular issues related to the plank of my party's platform are irrelevant to do I know the law? Am I calling balls and strikes? I, w I wish we could figure out a way, frankly, to eliminate partisan politics in the judiciary. Same way they do with the mayors, just take the letter away from the name. Yeah, Is that what's going mean, to happen but, when but, we're not on the straight ticket? No, I mean, you're still going to have party politics. You just have letter? to go through and vote every election as opposed to pulling the lever from right. the RD. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, and, and that doesn't start until 2020. I, yeah. I get you. I mean, about the mayor election, Houston, how it's it's non non political, but but everybody know who's knows who's behind which candidate. And I mean, sure. But the the reality is, I, I wish they didn't have political parties attached to judicial benches, but I don't know how else you do it because so a, number how else, a number of things. How else are you supposed to raise money to to be able to finance these campaigns? So first of all, increase the requirements. Uh, the education or make it so you have to be board certified in your field if you want to be a judge or have the the functional equivalent of that. Second of all, if you could take it away from the presidential or midterm elections and put it the judicial races in a special election, totally separate, then you don't have the hordes of, of voters who are only educated at the top of the ballot and all the way down. You're more likely to have people that will only show up for the judicial elections. And if there's not a D, an R, an L, a G, a, or whatever else next to the name, then maybe only the educated voters will show up to, to elect the judges that they know are more qualified. And you know, I've never heard that, but that's the best Plan. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to. We're gonna have to uh, send that to Chris Tritico <laughs> because he likes to tout his plan. But I think do a uh, panel like they did yeah. to pick out Alex Bunnen for the for the PD. Have a panel give a list of names. Well, that and qualified. that's very similar to what Missouri does. And I think that there are probably seven or eight states that have copied the Missouri plan, which is the bar association or a like-minded nonpartisan group okay. submits a list to the governor. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not partisan. The governor picks. I think it's a year after that person has been on the bench, there's a retention election, and either you've done well or the, the public votes to not retain you. Um, and then the- and That'd be great. Yeah. I've, heard, I, I've, I've recently, somebody recently told me that Judge Ross, I think he's gonna be on the show next week, hopefully Judge, um, was talking to me about that, and I found that fascinating. Hey, isn't Busby running for mayor now? He is. That's, that's the announcement from yesterday. Busby, come on the show, man. Where you at? <laughs> <laughs> you know, normally we would, in, we would take the last 30 seconds here and have each of you give a, a, a stump as to why, why uh, you should be elected. But I don't know. I mean, I kind of feel like we've kind of covered that uh, <laughs> through this whole thing. And, I mean, it's true. I mean, I, I think what we, what we touched on before that you guys are both great candidates and really the outcome is out of your control. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what's gonna happen. You guys don't know what's gonna happen, but I I'm just glad we're gonna have one of you at least on the bench. <laughs> and, and I do hope, uh, I mean, you know, we gotta start wrapping it up here, but I do hope that whoever doesn't get the bench will at least consider running one more time. <laughs> Right? Yes. Says so yes. the man Once, who's never run. Yeah. Uh, and, will, and will never run, uh, by, by the way. Oh, so, man. Um, but I do, I, I mean, I'm, I'm honored to count both of y'all as friends, honestly, because it, every time, you know, I've dealt with both y'all as prosecutors, dealing with y'all as defense lawyers, dealing with you as a judge, it's, it's just a pleasure. And, you know, you, you both are the type of people that make the Criminal Justice Center a great place to go to every day. So, appreciate uh, it. Yeah. And I wish both of y'all luck. And uh, who do we have lined up for next week? Do we know yet? I think Judge Yates and Judge Ross. We're hoping to get that firmed up. But yeah. we, uh, I'm getting the flash to wrap this up now. So for our guests, for Josh Hill and Judge Kristen Guinea, and for my co-host, the music wonder, Julio Vela. Back in the sun again. <laughs> oh, That's all the time we have for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back next week with another edition of Reasonable Doubt. Good night. <laughs>